But here's what I want you to think about, uh, continue to think about as we talk about team and teamwork and paying the price for work that has to be done. Think about Moses from the Bible. Moses knew he had limitations. He even told God when God called him to the work of delivering the nation of Israel from slavery in Egypt, that he couldn't do it. He told God he couldn't do it because he had some sort of what we think was a speech impediment. He, he, he couldn't speak clearly enough. So what did God do? God sent Moses, essentially, a teammate. Does anybody remember what that teammate's name was? It was Aaron. Aaron was his teammate. Jesus is another example of, of what it means to accomplish a significant task, significant work, but not to go it alone. As a matter of fact, Jesus, who regularly called all the religious leaders, all the high-powered political leaders of his day to account, he did this with a group of uneducated, temperamental, somewhat ill-trained folks. They all seemed to have good intentions, but he had them at his side. And Jesus knew that the work he was going to do, it required a team, a team that would be ready to pay the price for the work that had to be done. And this week we're going to continue to look at the work of Nehemiah and the work he took on when he took, he, he made plans to rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem. He too calls together others. In this story, Nehemiah works to gather the most talented, those with great gifts, in order to fulfill a vision that God had given him. Different folks contributing in different ways, paying the price to get the work done. And here's one thing that's critical to grasp as we continue to explore the work that Nehemiah, the builder, is doing, the builder of broken walls, what it means to do the work that maybe God has called you to. Folks, here's what I want you to, to get over everything else today. When we engage in the work that God calls us to, there will be resistance, conflict, and discouragement. God, however, will never leave our side in every single thing that we need to overcome our circumstance. He will faithfully provide. That's his promise. And so this morning, as we continue to look at this incredible feat that Nehemiah accomplished, there's two overarching themes that come to us from Nehemiah chapter 4. Two overarching themes. The first one is this. Opposition is inevitable. When you get ready to do the work of God, there's going to be opposition. It's inevitable. You can't run from it. You can't hide from it. Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, we read these words. When Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry. And greatly incensed, he ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Nye, 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 nye. He didn't really say that last part. I made that up. Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his side, meaning at the side of Sanballat, said, what are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it could break down the wall of stones. Folks, given the fact that this work to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, it's fairly new. But opposition to the rebuilding work, it did not take long to show up. When you get ready to do the work that God calls you to, it won't be long before someone gets in your face, gets in your way, and opposes what you have been called to do. And we've seen, as we've been journeying through the book of Nehemiah over the last few weeks, with his return to his homeland, with the approval of his king, King Artaxerxes, with all the equipment and supplies necessary to complete this work. Now, additionally, we learn that the people who he came back to be with, they responded earnestly. They were sold out. They wanted to begin this work. But as I shared, as I shared last week, these, these oppositional voices who make their oppositional presence known, they show up almost immediately. And see, this is the thing about those who oppose the work that God has called us to. These are voices who are threatened when God's work to accomplish his purposes through his people. Listen again. People who oppose you when you're doing the work of God, 
when they see that God is working, they're going to step up every time. It's inevitable. They will oppose the work of God. And I know several of you here probably know what I'm talking about. Perhaps you felt convicted. Maybe God's calling you to do something. He's maybe even given you the opportunity for you to do something that maybe is a little bit outside of your own comfort zone, that you might even have been a little bit caught off guard that God is talking to you about doing. And the resistance from others, the opposition that, uh, to you carrying out that task that God's calling you to, it can feel downright overwhelming. As a matter of fact, lots of times the opposition to what uh, we think God's calling us to, we begin to doubt. We go, well, did God really tell me to do that? Well, maybe they're right. Maybe I shouldn't do that. You know, yeah, maybe, 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 maybe it's really not God speaking to me. It's inevitable. That's what happens. And in the opposition, and in the case of Nehemiah, the opposition is vocal, it's frequent, it's fierce. And I love, though, what we read here in Nehemiah in terms of how we should respond to that kind of resistance and opposition. Nehemiah 4.13, oh, oh, we just read that, we just heard that read. Nehemiah says, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Now, some of you might say, what does it mean to remember the Lord when I'm facing resistance and opposition, Rob? Uh, what does that mean? What does that look like in 2024? And it may sound simple, and I think it is. It may sound simple, but here's what you do. It's the same thing we see Nehemiah do, the rebuilders of the walls of Jerusalem do. They pray, and then they pray, and then they pray. Believe it or not, they pray. That's what we see them literally do. Now, here are four ways you can actually pray. The first is you pray urgently. You don't need to be at church. You pray right where you are in that moment. You stop and you go to God. Another way that you pray is you pray passionately. You know what? God can handle your true feelings of frustration and fear. Don't think you need to protect him from what you're feeling. So you pray urgently. You pray passionately. You also pray realistically. See, the fact that God is being opposed by voices that are seeking to oppose you as you seek to do what God is calling you to do, that's not new to him. And so you just pray realistically. You say what needs to be said in that prayer and you say it again. Here's a fourth thing. You pray dependently. Pray dependently as if your only hope for overcoming the opposition that you are facing is indistinguishably linked to prayer. That's what Nehemiah did in Nehemiah chapter 4. He says, hear us our God. That's it. That's all you have to depend on. Folks, opposition to what we know God has called us to do, it's inevitable. And I need you to hear this as well. When we're called to pray, it's not because that magically makes things better or disappear, but rather it's an admission on our part that we recognize the difference that relying on the power of God can make. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not talking about magic. That's not what prayer is. It's talking about relying on God. It's about leaning on God. It's like trusting on God. Now, as you keep reading through this book of Nehemiah, something interesting also begins to happen, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But, you know, it's one thing for me just to say, okay, I'm going to go to God with something. Uh, you know, there's another part of this where I've got to do something. You know, I'm going to go to God, but I've got to do something. This is something critical to remember. Ron Cloak said this, he, he said this, after their long and weary exile in Babylon, the people of Israel were set free to return to their own land. They were spurred on by Nehemiah, and they began to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And this aroused the hostility of the pagans around them who threatened to undo their work. The people of Israel took two essential steps. They prayed to God, and they posted a guard day and night. Did you pick that up when we were reading? They posted a guard day and night. Even as they prayed for God's protection and help, they did what they could. They knew that prayer is not a way to avoid responsibility. It's not a shortcut to success without effort. That's not at all what prayer is. Prayer is a reliance. And that's what Nehemiah is telling the people as they rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So, it's incredibly encouraging news, even in the face of resistance, in the face of opposition, and the realization of needing help to do what they could 
This fourth chapter in Nehemiah also, uh, also reveals an inescapable fact, something that's irrefutable. That says the second thing that you need to know, God is invincible. <laughs> God has all the power. He has all the things. We read this in verse 14, Nehemiah chapter 4. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, to the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and daughters, your wives and your homes. In the midst of all the resistance, in the midst of all the opposition, the enemies who've come ready to dishearten, to dismiss, to disrupt the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, the center of Israel's religious life, Nehemiah, courageously, courageously, unambiguously, he reminds the people that the work from God cannot and actually will not be overcome. Jesus, Jeremiah, Nehemiah says three things. There are three things he says to Israel in this verse. Very simple. God is great. That's one thing he says. God is awesome. Is the next thing he says. God will fight. God is great. God is awesome. God will fight. Nehemiah and the people face danger from the hard physical work of their labor. There's emotional and psychological demands that they also have to manage. There are verbal attacks from the enemy. There's also the very real and present danger of physical attack from those same enemies as they do this work. Friends, in leading the work of rebuilding, Nehemiah is admitting. He's saying, yes, we will work hard. We will guard the walls. We will devise contingencies. And we will prepare for sneak attacks from the enemy of God. But in the end, when all is said and done, we have to remember these three things. God is great. God is awesome. And God will fight. This pressure that they faced when rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem is relentless. There's ridicule. There's contempt. There's mockery directed at those rebuilding the walls. There's this ever-growing fear. There's a feeling of even growing hopelessness. There are insecurities that appear, and from the looks of it, from the looks of it, some people, though, have returned to help. They, they, they'd been chased off a little bit earlier. But in verse 15, there's a slight Plot twist. When our enemies, Nehemiah says, heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. Even the enemies couldn't stand against God. God used Nehemiah to accomplish this work. It was work that was long past needing to be done. Folks, what about you? What is the work that's long past needing to be done where you live, where you are? Because if it's the work of God, God's invincible, and he wants you to do it. God can't be defeated. He cannot be held back. He can't be denied. He will accomplish his purposes. He will be honored the question that we have to ask, that we have to be ready to provide an answer to, is are we ready to pay the price in order to accomplish the work of God? Because we all will pay a price for doing the work of God. That's what we're seeing here in the book of Nehemiah. I remember very clearly as a young child hearing the news that someone had come and violently disrupted a church service, tragically shooting the mother of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It, it didn't make sense to me. And what made me even more alarmed was my mom was a Sunday school teacher. And as a kid, that's not a leap, that's a step. And I started thinking, well, could somebody come in here and shoot my mom? She's, she's here at church, just like his mom was. Simply at church, doing what she loved. In this case, though, she was playing the organ that day. 
I was thinking about the price, just thinking about this price that's paid for doing God's work. And I found an even more moving account of this memory. A guy named Henry Mitchell, he said this. He said, many years ago, I went to hear Dr. Martin Luther King Sr. And uh, Dr. King Sr. said his mother had told him when he was a little boy, always thank God for what was left. That was something to think about. If you've got enough breath left to complain, you have something left. I thought that was really impressive. And I made a mental note of it, says Henry Mitchell. Henry Mitchell goes on and he says, Sometime later, I went back to Atlanta, to Ebenezer Church, and by this time, Dr. King Sr. had lost both sons, A.D. and M.L., and he lost his beloved wife, who'd been shot to death right before his very eyes at the organ in their church sanctuary. Henry Mitchell says, guess what the old man was saying even then? He was saying, thank God for what's left. There's always enough left in life to make it worth living because when we are doing the work of God, while there's a price to be paid, God will never, ever leave us alone. Would you pray with me? God, as we look at this story of Nehemiah doing this, leading this impossible work, this, this incredibly draining work, God, we pray that we would appropriate for our lives these truths. God, you are great. You are powerful. God, you will provide. Lord, you never fail. Lord, it, it gets dark and it gets scary sometimes. But God, whatever you are calling us to, God, you will give us everything we need to, to move through whatever that challenge is. God, we pray that in this next week, we would say yes to you and to what you've called us to do. Lord, how you've called us to live our lives. Lord, perhaps to step into something that we've been reluctant to do because we didn't know or even because we had other people around us telling us that we weren't supposed to do what you've called us to do. God, that's a lie. May we, may we live knowing that you will be with us every step of the way and we can trust you. We love you and we thank you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.